beginning a new series this week uh, called Bethany Advent. I've already told you, Advent comes from Advent, Adventus uh, in the Latin, which simply means coming or arrival. And uh, when the Latin Vulgate was used as the common uh, Bible for the entire Christian world, uh, they called the season coming up to Christmas, the four Sundays before Advent. And so if you were to look it up in a dictionary, the first meaning is that season, that Christian season of four weeks prior to Christmas as being Advent. It's based on the Old Testament hope of arrival of a, a king, the king, the Messiah, and he was coming. And so the coming and arrival idea at Christmas just permeates this whole thing. Our readers read and they lit the first candle of hope. And that's where I want to pick up today. Advent hope. I want to talk about Advent hope. The first thing I want to talk about is the hope that we have that God is with us. If you were in the Gospel of Matthew, you would find that there begins by telling us that it's the Gospel uh, or it's the genealogy or the record of uh, David and Abraham. In the very first verse, you say he made a mistake because he put David before Abraham. It should have been Abraham and then David. But he didn't. He's trying to say, I'm prioritizing David because to David was made the promise to be the king. If you were reading Hebrew, you'd see the word David has three letters. Uh, the D, the V, and the D. And those are numbers because they don't have numbers in Hebrew. And if you take the numbers, it's four, six, and four. It makes 14. Three letters, and they add up to 14. It just so happens he arranges the genealogy. They're into three sections of 14 names each. And he does that very deliberately to say, I'm not talking about Abraham here. I'm talking about David. I'm talking about David's son. I'm talking about the hope that God would send a savior, a king, Messiah, the son of David. And then he says, and his name is going to be Jesus. And he records it all the way down to Mary. And he even talks about the virgin birth there. But we're not going to talk about that today. The conversation then in the book of Matthew turns from Mary to Joseph. Because Joseph finds himself in a dilemma. Just as it had been predicted by the angel, Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The power of the Almighty has overshadowed her and something is conceived supernaturally within her. And, and Joseph, her espoused married husband, Joseph finds himself in a dilemma. His wife is pregnant and he knows he is not the father. And so what is he going to do about that? He is going to divorce her. You see, the engagement was a binding contract. You could not get out of the marriage. Okay, You were, you were pledged to be married. You couldn't get out without a divorce. And so he's a righteous man, and he doesn't want, he doesn't want to disgrace the woman that he loves. And so he wants to divorce her privately. It's then that he falls asleep, and in his sleep, he dreams, and he dreams, and God in that dream sends an angel to him, and the angel of the Lord said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I love that verse. The word Jesus is really the Old Testament word Joshua, and the Old, word, Old Testament word Joshua means Jehovah saves. Isn't that great? Jesus, his very name means God saves. There's something about this child, because we know from the, later in the book of Luke, that angels appear and said that he's going to be the Savior, Christ the Savior. And so already we have the name Jesus as Jehovah saves through this child, and we give it, he's given his name Jesus, and that's how we know him. Then Matthew records this. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin, the virgin. 
Whereas in the Hebrew, the word Alma is kind of ambiguous, could mean a virgin who's never been slept with a man or a young woman. The Greek here that translates it divinely comments on the Old Testament, tells us exactly the way it should have been understood in the Old Testament. He uses the word Parthenon, which means actually a true legitimate virgin. She has not slept with a man. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel. I was working as a loader of the bundles of papers at the Detroit news plant downtown Detroit as a teenager. And I had gotten, you know, oh, supercharged in my faith and I was wearing a, a pin on my, my jacket while I'm working with this guy and said, you must be born again. Kind of like in your face. I, I like these little pins a lot better, right? But the, the, guy, the guy I'm working with just blurts out out of nowhere, I'm forgetting I got my pen on, he said, they got the wrong kid. I said, what? Where did that come from? He said, yeah, they got the wrong kid. I said, what are you talking about? He said, the Bible says his name's going to be Emmanuel, and you call him Jesus. You got the wrong kid. I said, whoa, 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 time out, time out here. <laughs> His name is Jesus because he will save his people from his sins. His name is also Emmanuel because he is God with us. You know what happened there? Oh, something really incredible happened. God became man. God was with us in a way he was never ever with man before. Incarnate, God took on him flesh. So Jesus, Jehovah who saves, was also Jehovah God who is now with us in bodily form here on planet Earth. Isn't that great? God was with us. Wow. A little review about God being with us, okay? Let's just do a little review. God was with Adam in the garden. When God created man in the garden, you remember the story, he formed the, of the dust of the ground, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And then the, he had to make a help meet for him, so he took a part out of his side, and he stretched, and he built a woman called Eve. And he placed them in the garden. They had the assigned task to till the garden, and the garden was a wonderful paradise of God. And the Bible tells us that God would come down in the cool of the day. I've still been trying to figure out what part of the day that is. Is that in the morning or is that in the evening? Literally, it's in the wind of the day. God would come down and he would actually be with Adam and converse with him face to face, voice to voice. When it says in Genesis chapter 3, it said, I heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. I love that. The voice. My voice does not walk. <laughs> I don't know how that works. But what it's saying is, God was actually present with him so that when he was speaking, it was voice to voice. God was with Adam. Wow, that's just mind-boggling. Some of you came with someone here today, and you'll be leaving with someone here today, or you'll be joining with someone today. Adam God would come down and join with him, and he was with God. With God. Something terrible happened, you know that. They disobeyed God, they rebelled against God, and sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all sinned in Adam were all sinners. And everything changed with that. God would come down, God kicked them out of the garden, and God was distanced from them. Spiritually, mankind died. So that it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, you are dead in your trespasses and sin. Spiritually, you have no connection with God. That's the way you're born into the world. You need a Savior. Thank God for the hope we have from the Old Testament that a Messiah was going to come who is Jesus Christ the Lord who would take away our sins. Isn't that great? You go a little further in the book of the Bible and you find this character. I love Noah. Noah it says, Noah was a righteous man and walked with God. I like that. Why? God was with him. 
He walked with God. The voice of the Lord came down and walked through the garden with Adam. But here it says Noah now is walking with God because he's a righteous man. He places his faith in God that he will one day send the hope of the world, the Savior will die on the cross. He's got this hope in this God and he walks with God. It doesn't say he runs. It doesn't say he stands. He walks. He makes progress with his God in a daily relationship with God. He was like his great, great, great grandfather and a guy by the name of Enoch who walked with God and was not because God took him. Boom. Just took him to heaven. Can you imagine that? Here he was one day walking home, you know, and God is walking with him. Enoch and God are walking and God just kind of taps him on his shoulder and says, Enoch, you're not going to your house today. You're going with me. Boom. He was gone to heaven. Folks, that's what it's going to be in the rapture. <laughs> you're going to be walking along, and all of a sudden you're with Jesus. You're with Jesus. Noah walked with God. You know what happened. He, had, he built an ark 120 years in a preparation. He's preaching. He's getting no converts. It's never about numbers. Remember that. It's always about obedience and service to our King. Noah walked with God. We go a little bit further and we find a guy by the name of Abraham. Abraham walks with God. And it doesn't say that, but you know that he does. Because Abraham is called on by God to offer up his only son, Isaac, well, which he will do. But God was there and said as he lifted up his knife to sacrifice his son in obedience to God, God interrupts him and says, Abraham, Abraham. And he says, here I am. <laughs> He says, don't do any harm to your son. And caught in the thickets was a ram, and he sacrificed a ram in the place of his son. And, uh, but Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. He knew that God was with him. <laughs> then there was a nation, Israel. <clears throat> Told Moses, I want you to build a, a tabernacle, a tent Ten of meeting, a place where I'm going to come, I'll meet with you. How can a holy God dwell among an unholy people? And we're going to do it through a system of a tent. And you build this tabernacle, and this is what happened. God would actually come down upon it in a form of a cloud by day, indicating that he was actually inside the tabernacle. And that cloud by day, and it said, as it dawned and tur or as it turned in evening uh, tonight, it would turn into a pillar of fire. Wow. That cloud was there every day, every night. And you say to yourself, how could they sin so grievously against the Lord when it was right there in their face every day? Wow. And how can I, who has the Holy Spirit within me, so grievously sin every day when I have him within me? We're sinners. We need the salvation of God. Well, after this tabernacle was replaced with the temple, Solomon, he replaced it with the temple. And in his dedication prayer in 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek your face, all of that, he's praying uh, to dedicate the temple. And it tells us in that passage that the place was filled with smoke and the glory, Shekinah glory cloud of the Lord was over the place again because God was with his people. Isn't that great? And guess what? Again, at night it turned into a pillar of fire. Do you realize for over 700 years, every day there was a cloud. Every day there was a pillar of fire. Every day, every day, every day. Wow. Come to the book of Ezekiel and you find this happened. The glory of the Lord departed. The people were so wicked. God was going to bring judgment upon them. He was going to destroy the Solomon's temple. Uh, and uh, so we, we find that the glory of the Lord departed, the temple was destroyed, and it was rebuilt. It was rebuilt by Zerubbabel and in the time of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah. And it, the temple was rebuilt, but there was something missing. The glory cloud was not there. The pillar of fire was not there. Herod expanded and enlarged on it. It was a beautiful building. It looked something like this, we believe. But the glory cloud was not there. God was not in that temple. Until something unusual happened. God brought his son back and baby Jesus on eight years old, circumcised and dedicated 
was brought into the temple, the glory returned to the temple. God was back with his people. Guess where he is now? (laughs) He is with you. The hope of glory. That's what Christmas is all about. God sent his son, and he now doesn't fill up buildings like this. There's no cloud over it as a pillar. You, I sure hope you don't see any fire on top of this building. Okay, the, 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 That's not the way it works. Today he is in you. On the day of Pentecost, cloven tongues of fire stood upon the heads of everyone that was filled with the Spirit of God as he baptized those people into the body of Christ, which is the church. He is in the church, not the building, the people. He is in you. He is with you. He is with you. God has said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Jesus said this, as surely and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Which is why I'm carrying my bulletin around. I want to read the poem. Some of you have already heard this poem, but it's so good, so good. One night as I dreamed a dream, as I was walking along the beach with the Lord, Across the sky flash flash scenes from my life. Each scene I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me. So I asked the Lord about it. Lord... You said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I need you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you, never ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then I carried you. Isn't that right? Amen. Sometime later, another guy said, I had a similar dream. One night I had a wondrous dream. One set of footprints there was seen. Footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. But then some stranger prince appeared, and I asked the Lord, what have we here? Those prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they are too big for feet. My child, he said in somber tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenge you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. You disobeyed, you would not grow the walk of faith, you would not know. So I got tired, I got fed up, and there I dropped you on your butt. Because in life there comes a time when a man must fight and men must climb, When men must rise and take a stand or leave their butt prints in the sand. Yeah, there's prints in the sand. So what's the point of all that? Why would I read those right now for this reason? God never leaves you. He is always with you. Listen, quit whining. Get off your tush and serve the Lord. Amen? Yeah, he's with you. Not only do we have the hope that he is with us, but we have the hope that God is in us. He is in us. Listen, Jesus said, On that day you will realize that I am am in my Father. I don't know how to depict the Father, so I got this burst of light because God is invisible. I don't know what I did there, but God is invisible. Yes, Lord, we're paying attention. God is invisible. You can't see Him, so I just put this burst of light. He said, Jesus said, I am in my Father. I am in my Father. Christ, who died on the cross, I am in the Father. And you are in me. He's talking to the disciples. You are in me. You are in Christ, so I'm in the Father. And I am in you. Christ is in me. This is amazing. Christ is in me. Listen, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and and we we will come to him, 
and make our home with Him. Listen, my body is the home of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God is in me. I don't have to go very far to find God. He knows my every single thought. He knows my every single feeling. Even when I'm rationalizing with myself, he knows the truth. I can try to rationalize all the way. He will never leave me nor forsake me. He is in me. In fact, it says in Ephesians 3, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being. Where is he? The Holy Spirit's in my inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Where does he dwell? In my heart. The Father is in me, the Son is in me, the Holy Spirit's in me. Man, I, God is in me. I cannot escape Him. He says in 2 Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, I'm in Him, He's in me, He's a new cre creation. Listen to what He says. The old is gone. Let's get rid of it. The old is gone. And the new has come. These are great verses, great verses. What does this practically mean to me? This is what it practically means. You can exchange your past for his future. You do not have to live in the past and say, well, that's just the way I am. Don't we do that? I even tell that to my wife, and then she reminds me, oh, you know what, you preach a different message. <laughs> You don't have to be who you were. You can be someone new. People say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, yes, you can exchange your past for his future. You can be a whole new person because God is in you. Here's the other thing. You can never ex escape his presence. You can't really hide from God. Quit trying. Quit trying. He knows the very thoughts and intentions of your heart. According to the book of Hebrews, he knows you inside and out. He knows the hairs on your head, and you can never escape his presence. The psalmist says in 100, Psalm 139, even if I go into hell, you are there. You can't escape him. You go to heaven, he is there. Jonah tried to escape him, and God says, oh, no, no, Jonah, overboard. I got a fish prepared just for you. <laughs> listen, listen, you can't escape God. He's always with you. He's not far from you. So that means you take him everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, God goes with you. Everything you watch, God is with you. Everything you listen to, God is with you. I once heard a preacher saying, this guy was cursing, and I went up to him, I looked at the side of his head and said, by golly, I don't see it. He said, what? What don't you see? He said, well, I don't see the handle to flush your mouth. You know, sometimes we, we just got to say, I've had enough of that kind of language. You're dumping it on the temple of the living God. You take him everywhere you go. Your body matters to God. It does. Because this is his home too. He lives in us. He lives in us. Not only is there hope that he is with us and he is for us, but we have the hope uh, or that, that he is in us, but he has the hope that he is for us. All three of these. Now the hope here that he is for us, I, I, I just want to pick one aspect of that. It's the hope that God is returning for us. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. <laughs> we're going to be with him. He's coming back for us. He's returning for us so that I can be where he is. Listen. He is coming back just as Jesus says. It says in the book of Acts, this same Jesus who has been taken up from you will come back in the same manner as you have seen him go. He went into heaven. He's coming back again. There was the first advent and there is a second advent. He's coming again. 
He is coming again. This is our hope. How do I know it's our hope? Because the Bible tells me it's our hope. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Jesus Christ has come into the world. He, the angel were saying, Glory to God in the highest. Peace, good will toward all men. He says here, salvation has appeared to all men in Jesus Christ. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly lust. It says to, to have self-control, to be upright and live a godly life in this present age in which we live while we wait for the blessed hope. What is that blessed hope? What is our most blessed hope? Here it is. The glorious second advent appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. He is coming back. He is coming back. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet uh, call of God. And the dead in Christ are going to rise. And after that, we who are alive and still remain will be caught up with them together in the air to meet the clouds, and to meet the Lord in the clouds of the air. And, and it says here, so we will be with the Lord forever. Listen, he's going to return for us. That is our hope. This is not all there is. That is our hope. He says, I tell you the mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash and a twinkling of eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised and we will be changed. He's coming for us. Joyce Heiss. Her spirit is gone to be with the Lord. But when he comes, the body is summoned. Her spirit will be rejoined with her body. She will ever be with the Lord. That is our hope. Our hope today is that Jesus would come today and I could skip death and actually go to be with Jesus without ever dying. Like Enoch, who walked with God, and God said, hey, Enoch, you're not going to your house tonight. You're coming home with me. Boom, out of there, just like that picture of this rapture he says when the perishable have been clothed with imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality then will be the saying that is written in the scripture will come true death has been swallowed up in victory our hope is that we are on the willing winning side and this isn't the kind of hope that like boy i sure hope that my wife gets me you fill in the blank for Christmas. <laughs> you ever had a disappointment at Christmas? I think it, was, it comes in the teen years. When you realize for the first time, uh, there's no toys. Uh, you're getting stuff like, you look at all the younger sibling or kids and they got piles and stack of toys and you got this measly little gift card. <laughs> And you, you, it kind of crashes. Listen, you know why? You didn't get what you had hoped for. Really, it was what you were wishing for, wishing for. Bible hope is not wishing. Bible hope is grounded in reality. He came the first time. The reality is he's coming the second time. I have hope because it is true, not because it's wishful thinking. Death is going to be swallowed up in victory. That is my hope. I know it to be true. And so I build my life on that. It is my hope because it is true. It is going to happen. Not wishful thinking. We wait for the blessed hope of the advent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what I want you to take home with you today. God is with you. God is in you. God is for you. That's our Advent hope. So this is what I want you to do today. I want you to say with me, God is with me. God is in me. God is for me. Come on, you can say that with me. Here we go. God is with me. God is in me. God is for me. Now say it like you really mean it. God is with me. God is in me. And God is for me. Amen? That is our Advent hope. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful that look, the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world.
He went to the cross. He paid in full the price of our sins and gave us eternal life. He has risen from the dead. He's ascended into heaven and he is coming back for us. He is our Advent hope. In the first Advent and our hope for the second Advent. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.